Well, good morning, Meadowbrook. How are we doing this morning? It's good to see you all. Special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We're glad you're with us as well. So it was last Saturday afternoon, and I was at a soccer game for our daughter. It was one of those rainy Saturday afternoons where you're kind of hunkered under an umbrella. And the game was at Longfellow Middle School. So behind Longfellow Middle School, there is a soccer field. There's also a baseball field and some tennis courts. And they all kind of come together, and we're sitting in this grass area uh, in between them all just watching our daughter's game. And there's a baseball game happening at the baseball field behind us. And at the beginning of the second half, this ball, baseball, rolls right by me and goes right out onto the field. And I know that it's from the game. And so I'm thinking, well, I've got to be a good parent here and go grab this ball uh, before one of the kids trips on it. So I go grab the ball, run to the sideline, and I turn to throw and just throw it. There's a kid by the fence who's waiting for it. And I turn to throw, and I'm like, this is no problem for me. Like, <laughs> I played quarterback in high school. Like, that can't be more than 20 yards. I got it, and I just let it go. And as I'm watching it in the air, I'm like, oh, it's not going to make it over the fence, <laughs> which would be no big deal, right? No big deal. You just go pick it up. But there's like 50 parents all on the sideline. <laughs> they see the ball. They see me pick it up, they see me throw it, and they're just watching it, and then it like hits the fence and goes, joo -joo. you know that moment in the movie Sandlot where, Sandlot where Scotty Smalls throws the baseball for the first time, like all the kids laugh at him because he can't throw? It felt like that. There's some friends whose daughter is also on our daughter's team sitting to the right of us, and they're like, you played quarterback in high school? That's an easy throw. There's some people who go to another church. They go to Eastbrook Church. Their daughter was on the opposing team, and they're like, you can't make that throw. This guy, after the game, I've only met him two weeks ago, working concessions at my daughter's theater production. He comes up to me, and he's like, hey, how about that throw there? <laughs> like, everybody's making fun of me. So as soon as it hits the fence and goes down, I'm like, oh, I know everybody. Like, you could, there's this collective, like, oh, that happens on the sideline. Poor guy. So I just, like, put my hood up. I, like, I hunker down under my umbrella, and I'm just like, all right, I got to deal with it. Like, we have moments like that in our life where we, we do something silly, we do something like, it's not that big a deal, we feel a little embarrassed, hopefully we can laugh at ourselves, and we move on, right? That's the embarrassment that sometimes just comes our way in life. But then there are other moments that there's embarrassment there, but there's also something else that comes along with that embarrassment that is way more painful. So I'm now, rewind, I'm in high school, it's a Saturday afternoon. I'm at home alone. I'm eating lunch in the kitchen. We have this little like analog 13-inch TV in the corner of our kitchen. I'm watching a basketball game as I'm eating a sandwich, and the phone rings. So I just go pick up the phone. Hello, this is the Marvels. They ask for my parents. My parents aren't home. I said they're not home. The lady on the other end of the phone said something that I perceived as rude. And so I kind of went, huh mumbled something under my breath as I hung up the phone and then moved on. Finish eating lunch, finish watching the basketball game, go to the next day. It's Sunday. Our family goes to church. We come home, and again, we're eating lunch in the kitchen, and we're all about to scatter and go our own way, and my parents say, hey, Brian, can you hang back a minute? I'm like, yeah, sure, what's up? And they said, so you were here by yourself yesterday, around noon, right? I was like, yeah. Was like, a phone call came through, right? I was like, uh-huh. Like, how do they know that, right? Because this is before caller ID. This is before you track every single call that comes into your phone. And I'm like, yeah. They're like, by any chance, did you say something before you hung up that phone? And I was like, uh, maybe? But like, I knew they had me. Like, I knew that I was busted. I knew that I was caught because what I mumbled under my breath wasn't just a like, how rude, but it was an inappropriate word that you should never call anybody, let alone call a lady that word. And they said, what did you say? And I actually had to say the word to my parents. And then they said, do you know who was on the phone? And I said, no, I don't. They said, it was the wife of one of your dad's colleagues. 
And because of the nature of my dad's work, like we were around his workplace all the time. I saw this guy all the time. His wife happened to be there quite often, so we would see them regularly. And I was like mortified because I knew there was going to be a moment where I would have to stand face to face with her and like just have this thing out there between us. What I didn't know was that that moment was going to happen right then and there. Because they said, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to their house right now and you are going to go apologize to her in person. And I just wanted to crawl in a hole and die. There was embarrassment there, but the thing that came with it was shame. Shame has incredible power in our lives, and shame can be this strong force that just makes us want to shrivel up and die. There's embarrassment, which is one thing, But then shame is a whole nother level of embarrassment with a whole nother reality for how we perceive ourselves. And the question for us is what happens when your shame is exposed? What do you do when your shame is exposed? It's on display for everybody to see. The passage that we're at looking at this morning in John 8 deals with that very question of what to do, and how we can respond when our shame is on full display. This is what we read, chapter 8, starting in verse 1. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. What's happening in chapter 8 is there's a transition, obviously, from chapter 7, but you're transitioning from one day to the next because we read in verse 2, at dawn he appeared again in the temple court. So Jesus was in the temple courts at the end of chapter 7, When his day finishes, he goes to the Mount of Olives. We're not told what he's doing there. Good chance he's going there to pray, a normal practice of Jesus, to spend an evening praying. It's dawn, morning comes, and he goes back to the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. Now, chapter 8 is simply an extension of the scene that happens in chapter 7. And we're told in chapter 7 that Jesus is in Jerusalem along with so many other people throughout Israel because they're celebrating a festival, specifically the festival of the tabernacles, which does two things. One, it remembers the wilderness wanderings of the Israelites back in Exodus when they were redeemed from slavery in Egypt. And two, it celebrates the provision that God gave to his people at that time and celebrates the continual provision that God is offering his people. So Jews from all over Israel would come to Jerusalem to celebrate this festival. And we're told, verse 14 of chapter 7, that Jesus also goes up to the festival. And halfway through the festival, he goes into the temple courts and he begins to teach. So chapter 7 is presented as one day of teaching. Chapter 8 rolls along, and you have verse 2, at dawn, Jesus goes back to the temple courts. Chapter 8 is presented as another day of Jesus teaching in the temple. And while he's teaching in the temple, this is what happens. Verse 3, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group. So again, we're told it's early in the morning. It's dawn. The sun's just coming up. Jesus is teaching. It's probably a peaceful moment. You know, like when the sun's coming up and it just feels like ah, everything's right in the world and you have your coffee. And if you're somebody who reads in the morning, it's like, ah, this is peaceful. I get to listen to the birds sing and just, ah. So it's probably a peaceful moment with Jesus teaching. And in bus, the Pharisees creating a commotion, dragging this woman with her who obviously doesn't want to be there. And they place her in front of this whole group and in front of Jesus. Now, over the last few chapters, there's a growing tension between Jesus and the Pharisees. There's growing tension and conflict to the point where we're told that the Jewish leaders actually want to kill. They're actively plotting the death of Jesus. So the fact that they're bringing in this woman probably means that there's more happening than it appears with them trying to bring some sort of justice to the scenario. But imagine being this woman caught in the middle of your worst moment, being accosted by some group and hauled to the most religious public place, the center of Israel, the temple, and put right 
in front of Jesus, brought publicly for her sin and her shame to be on full display. That's exactly what the Pharisees are doing. They're intentionally exposing this woman's sin and shame. It would be like me just picking somebody out of the crowd this morning, like, hey, come up here. I don't give you a choice. Like, you come up here. Stand right next to me. And what we do on the screen behind me is we scroll through all of your worst moments for everybody to see. One of those moments where you berate your kids at your house behind closed doors when nobody else is around and you say things to them that you would be mortified if anybody knew that you would ever say those things to your kids. And it's just on full display on the screen for everybody to watch. Or we go through your Google history, all of those things that you strategically delete from your Google history so there is no record that you have ever typed that in to a search bar. Or we have the ability to expose your scrolling judgmental thoughts that you have of the people in your community, your workplace, or even here at church. Anybody want to do that? Anybody sign up for that? Like, mm, no way. It would feel as though a waterfall of shame is washing over you and you are drowning in shame. Probably the most terrifying moment of your life. And you would probably start to believe in that moment, yeah, this is truly who I am. See, there's a difference. Sometimes we compare shame and embarrassment, but also there are other times where we compare guilt and shame. And guilt usually has this association of, I've done something wrong. But then shame is like, I am wrong. Guilt is usually associated with an action. Shame is usually associated with your identity. Like, this is who I am. The sum total of my life is all of my worst moments. And when people learn who that is, oh, it feels like a living death. Kurt Thompson, who's a psychologist and a writer, has a great book on shame called The Soul of Shame. And he says the power of shame in our lives, what it does to us is creates this fear that I will be abandoned, that I will be alone, that if people found out who I truly am, if people found out the worst things that I've done, they will leave me, abandon me, and I will be fully left alone. That's what shame does. It creates this fear that we will be abandoned. So we work tirelessly, whether we are conscious of it or not, to push down, to hide, and repress that shame so that no one will ever know. Ever. Um, We live in a world where cybersecurity is always on the forefront of organizations' minds. We have to keep people safe online. There's all these hackers out there. Identity theft is happening all the time. People work really hard to try and keep cybersecurity a high priority. In 2015, one of the most prolific media profiles of a cyber attack happened that summer to a dating website of all companies. Now, dating websites are often created for single people to meet other single people, to go on a date, maybe to find a lifelong partner. This dating website was actually geared towards married people who could go find other married people who wanted to have an affair but could do it in secret. Many of you probably remember this story. It was huge. All summer of 2015, it was on the forefront of the news. And the idea was their tagline was, life is short. Why not have an affair, right? Why not do it in secret? And so they, they kind of made this big deal that we keep your privacy, you know, we're secrecy, it's all locked up and buttoned up. So a hacker was able to hack into their system and get all of the information of every user on that site. And their threat was shut your company down in 30 days or we will release all of this information. Anybody who ever signed up for the site, anybody who ever used the site, all of their profiles, we will release it all. And they did. That whole summer, I mean, it was all over the news all the time. One of the shocking things of that list, of some 70 million users, was the number of pastors and ministry workers on that list. 
And Netflix just released a documentary series on that company, on that moment. And they chose a couple Christians whose names were on that list to process through with them publicly how, how they worked through that. One of them was a seminary professor um, at New Orleans Seminary. Uh, he goes into work one morning, called into the dean's office. This list has just been released. Somehow somebody found his name on that list, reported it to the dean, and the dean said, we have to accept your resignation immediately. And he knew. Like, he knew he was caught. He knew he would never be able to teach in a seminary again. He knew that he could never walk into a classroom and have any credibility. And what he did was he went home and he took his own life. He ended it right then and there. Because the shame was so great. The shame was so strong. When your shame is exposed publicly for everybody to see, it can feel like a living death. And that's exactly what these Pharisees are doing to this woman. Because the power of shame is strong. Now, the Pharisees are intentionally doing this to this woman, and we're not told her emotional reaction, but you've got to imagine, like, she wants to run, she wants to hide, she wants to go to another town, she wants to start over. But the focus shifts pretty quick away from her to something else, to, to why they are bringing her. Because what they're trying to do is they're using her in a plot to try and trap Jesus. This is what we read in verse 4. And they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery, and the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? Verse 6, they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. So they're trying to put Jesus in a lose-lose situation because their perception is Jesus doesn't abide by the Mosaic law. Chapter 5, he healed a man on the Sabbath. Their perception was he's desecrating the Sabbath. He's not honoring the Sabbath. He's not resting on the Sabbath. This guy is a rogue teacher. He's dangerous, and we need to do away with him. And so they put him in what they perceive as a lose-lose situation. If he agrees with them, like, yes, stone this woman, he, he probably looks like a jerk, but yet they agree with him, and so they realize, ah, maybe he's a friend rather than a foe. But if he demonstrates compassion and is kind to this woman, it gives us all the more reason to justify accusing him and hopefully killing him. And Jesus in this moment receives this question, but he doesn't answer. Verse 6, but Jesus instead bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. If there was ever a Jesus-esque moment in the Gospels, like this is it. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh, mm-hmm, okay. Just, and nobody knows what he's writing, and nobody knows exactly why he does this, There's so much speculation, like, is he trying to buy time? Is he trying to think of his response? Is he just creating tension and conflict and getting them to pay attention? Like, what exactly is he doing? And as he bends down to write, we're told that the the Pharisees continue to pepper him with questions. We're told in verse 7, they kept on questioning. And again, we're not told the questions they asked, but I wonder. It's like, hey, Like, who do you think you are? Are you really qualified to even answer this question? Who is your rabbi? Where did you get your training? You say you know the law. You say you've come from God. What do you think God thinks of this woman? He, in fact, has already told us what he thinks of this woman because he wrote about it in the Mosaic Law. They're just coming after him, berating him with questions. And he's just standing there poised, writing, not stressed. And then he stands up, right? He straightened up, verse 7. Says. And I imagine silence whoo, came across the crowd. Like, what is he going to say? He knew the Pharisees are like waiting. This is their moment. They're thinking, we have got him cornered right where we want him. And he says to them, Let any one of you who is without sin throw the first stone at her. Basically, he's saying, Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Let your stones fly. Give them a throw. Let her have it. Show her and everybody else here who's in charge, but only if you can stand in her place with a clear conscience 
that you have never sinned. And then, verse 8. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Now, some scholars say this was a really like risky thing for Jesus to do because there might have been one young hothead in that group who's like, yeah, I've never sinned before and just let it go. I'm going to do what he said. Now, Jesus being Jesus knows, right? He knows. But you never know. There could have been one guy who really thought, yeah, I measure up to that. And so what Jesus is doing in this moment, in their action of exposing this woman's sin and shame, Jesus is calling them to honest examination of themselves, calling them to look primarily at themselves. So in this Netflix documentary on the data breach of this dating website, the story of the professor of all the storylines, of all the couples, of all the people, was the one that caught my attention the most. Because they obviously couldn't interview him, but they interviewed his wife. And and she said and commented on the infatuation that people had for knowing whose names were on that list. Now, journalists were poring over these lists because, you know, it's probably part of their job, but There were just other people who were infatuated with who's on that list. Other websites popped up that just had search engines where you could search the 70 million people just by typing in a name, and it would show you if that name was on that list. Like, people were infatuated. Who is on that list? And she said, for those whose names were not on that list, there was a whole lot of self-righteousness that was being displayed. And she probably saw a lot of it because of her husband's name being on that list. And that's exactly where the Pharisees are in this moment. They're perceiving themselves to be morally superior, self-righteous. At least we're not like her. The reason we can bring her before you is because we're separate from her. There's something different from, uh, with us from her. We are not like her. And if we're honest and we're walking in what Paul calls the flesh, the state of our fallen self, our sin nature, and we are walking in self-righteousness, we can be really drawn and curious about the dirt of other people. I mean, how many of you have ever been on a playground picking up your kids at school, and you're in a conversation that starts with, hey, did you hear about so-and-so? Did you hear that news? Right? Or if you've ever been around the office in the workplace and you're in a conversation with like, hey, did you hear the real reason why so-and-so got let go? I mean, it even happens in the church world. Hey, did you hear what's going on at that church down the road and why people are leaving that church? Like when we're walking in moral superiority, self-righteousness, we are drawn to the dirt of others probably so that we can work at continuing to push down and hide the shame that so readily wants to bubble up in our own heart. And the most insightful thing that was said in the almost three-hour documentary on Netflix about that dating website was said by this professor's wife. She said, there's so much self-righteousness going on from all the people whose names were not on that list But here's the thing, all of us and all of our names are on some list of things that we've done that if it was ever brought to light, the shame would be overwhelming and overbearing and we might do the same thing my husband did. Because all of our names are on a list. Because we've all done things that we would never want brought to the light of day. So the question is for us, yeah, what is that thing? What is that thing for you? What are those things? And what do you do with it? How do you navigate it? How do you work to resolve it? Now, in this moment, Jesus is calling the Pharisees and us, basically, to focus on the log sticking out of our own eye rather than worrying about the speck of dust in somebody else's eyes. And at least for this moment, it's driven home for the Pharisees because we read this in verse 9. 
At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. This might be the only place in the Gospels where, Je- where the Pharisees actually respond to Jesus in a way he's leading them. Because, again, Jesus is riding on the ground. They peel away one at a time. All the Pharisees leave. And then Jesus stands up, verse 10. Jesus straightened up, and he asked this woman, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus has a different response to our sin. Jesus doesn't shame us for our sin. He doesn't use it against us. While the Pharisees are trying to expose this woman's sin in shame, Jesus seeks to eliminate our sin and shame. So therefore, we don't need to be afraid of it because we can have confidence that it doesn't define us, and that Jesus will continue to love us through it. The power of shame might be strong, but the grace of God is greater. And that's the good news of the gospel. I don't know if you've ever been in a relationship where somebody in that relationship does something stupid, does something public, does something that brings shame on them, and instinctively, you just kind of distance yourself from them because you're afraid that the shame that's being heaped on them, if you're too close in proximity, might actually find its way to you. The good news of the gospel is that even when your shame is exposed, Jesus doesn't distance himself and say, hey, I still love you, just from a distance. He comes right up with you, and he says, I'll walk with you through this. I'll even take on that shame and bear it myself to release you from it fully. That's what he does on the cross. He steps into our shame. He gets closer to us in our worst moments. He takes on our shame and sets us free and says, you can put it all on me. That is the best news for those who are struggling with shame, who are trying to suppress things in their life. The good news of the gospel is it doesn't define you. Your worst moments in life don't define you. The thing that defines you for those who have given and surrendered their life to Jesus is that it's Him and His love and His goodness and His mercy and His grace. It says in Psalm 103, the Lord is gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in love. It says at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, He says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will never turn my back on you. I will regularly take on the worst moments of your life and release you free, leaving you defined only by my love. That is the good news of the gospel. And when you take hold of that, it has the power to change you. That's why Jesus says in verse 11, it says, the last thing he says to this woman, go now and leave your life of sin. It's not as though he's wagging his finger saying, like, all right, now leave here and go do better. Leave here and try not to mess up anymore. He's saying, no, no, go walk in the freedom of the love that I have for you, that you have been forgiven, that you are not condemned, and go live the life that you were created for, believing and knowing that all of your deepest longings are found in me. And it sets you on a path to the freedom you have always wanted. And so for us, the question is, what is the shame that is haunting you? What is the shame that you are working to push down and hide in hopes that no one will ever see? Where do you need to be honest, starting with yourself, about the things that you are hiding, and then finding a trusted person to open that up with and to say it to them? Because here's how shame loses its power over your life, is simply by naming it by naming that that's the thing I'm hiding. As soon as you say that, it begins to loosen its grip and no longer has the ability to control you. And the thing that does start to empower you is the goodness and the grace of God. And do you want greater freedom in your life? Because nobody's ever going to say, I want to be controlled by shame. Nobody's going to say that. But lots of people will readily say, I would love 
for greater freedom. It starts by naming the thing that's controlling you, turning your back on it, going to Jesus, trusting that his love and his love alone is the thing that defines you and ultimately sets you free because his grace is greater than your shame. So, may you be quick to put down your stones and no longer judge other people. May you be willing to step into honest self-examination and may you find the freedom your heart longs for in the love of Jesus and the grace of God. Lord, we are so grateful that we have the example of Jesus' love for us. We are so thankful for the power that is given to us through the gospel to set us free. Lord, I pray that you would continue to show us how strong and mighty in your love is for us and that we would believe wholeheartedly that you will never leave us nor forsake us that you will always be faithful to us, even to our life's end. Amen.